Good afternoon. Currently, all participants are in a listen-only mode. There will be a Q&A session at the end of each module. Throughout the webinar, please enter your questions in the chat Q&A pod located to the left of the presentation. Please type any technical questions in that same pod. The link to download a PDF of the slides is also listed in a note pod to the left of the presentation. Please cut and paste this link into your web browser for easy download. At the top of the screen, you have an icon showing a raised hand. Please click on it. You'll see a drop-down list of icons you can use to signal the speaker your reaction to the material and requests as to the speed. We remind you to use the Q&A pod at the left bottom part of the screen for your questions. You have a full screen button at the top right corner of your screen. We advise you not to use this option, as you will not see the polling questions in the full screen mode. If at any time you have difficulty hearing the webinar, please dial 866-792-6260 to listen using your phone. I would now like to turn it over to your moderator, moderator for today, Shari Zinman. Thank you, Carrie. Hello, my name is Shari Zim and I will be your moderator for today's session. Welcome to the CCH online webinar, Mitigating Risk in Client Relationships and Ethics, Practical Tools for Corporate Counsel. CCH has developed this online webinar in partnership with the Canadian Corporate Counsel Association. Today's webinar will provide you with knowledge on corporate counsel's role in risk management and will help you understand the importance of determining who is my client and what is my role, as well as examines ethics in relation to risk management. Ms. Catherine Workin and Ms. Diane Tucker will share with you practical tools and advice on raising issues of and advising on risk management from the legal department's perspective. Upon conclusion of today's session, you will be directed to complete a brief online survey. Please participate. Your opinion is very important to us. Survey participants will be entered into a draw to win $100. We will provide instructions to access the survey at the end of the webinar. Please note that the link to today's PowerPoint presentation slides is provided on the left-hand side of your screen. After the webinar, you will also be emailed the slides and the panel's responses to several unanswered questions that will be submitted by participants today. We will also provide a link to the recording. So at this time, I would like to introduce you to your keynote speakers, Diane Tucker and Catherine Workin. Diane Tucker has acted as in-house counsel since 1986 in a variety of industries, including food, high-tech, and entertainment for companies such as Dole Package Foods, Sony Computer Entertainment America, Sega of America, and AirG Inc. She has been in legal departments ranging in size from one lawyer operations to numerous counsel, each with an area of specialization. The entities in which she has advised array in size from 100 personnel to thousands of employees. In the past 10 years, Ms. Tucker has inaugurated legal departments in three separate, already successful companies. Ms. Tucker's experience includes IP, contracts, litigation, and litigation management, regulatory compliance, policy creation, and process implementation, and engagement and coordination of external counsel. Her knowledge assets encompass product development, enterprise and consumer software, and advertising and other relevant marketing in traditional and new media, as well as academic pursuits such as U.S. constitutional law and civil procedure. She has also lectured in both Canada and the United States on the practical and legal aspects of records management. Additionally, Ms. Tucker is the Vice President of the Board of Directors of Flash Days Arts in Coquitlam, BC, a non-profit art center and music school offering high-quality arts education for all ages and abilities. Catherine A. Workin, QC, is Siegel, sorry, Senior Counsel at TELUS, where she supports the Customer Solutions Team on major transactions with large customers in the oil and gas financial services, education, and health sectors ranging in value up to billions of dollars. Her practice focuses on technology law and commercial transactions related to technology. However, she also primes legal support for TELUS business marketing and advertising groups. Ms. Workham obtained her LLB and MBA from the University of Alberta. Ms. Workham is active in the community and is on the board of directors and part of the executive for IT.can, a member of the City of Edmonton's Community Advisory Board. Chair of the City of Edmonton's Family and Community Support Services Committee, and also a member of the Credentials and Education Committee with the Law Society of Alberta. So, with that, I welcome Diane. Hi, everybody. Good morning, or at least good day. I'm here in Vancouver. It's morning. 
Um, Catherine and I have very different backgrounds, and we just wanted to tell you a little bit more about ourselves before we begin the presentation this morning. I started out in practice a long time ago in a litigation department in a large law firm in San Francisco, and then moved to in-house counsel, and during, um, interspersed within these practices of law I've been teaching. Um, I'm licensed to practice in California. I'm not a member of any law society in Canada. Um, I work under a license from the Law Society of British Columbia as a practitioner of foreign law when I work here in Vancouver. Um, as a result, I can't advise you on Canadian law. I'm approaching the section that I'll be um, spearheading this afternoon, which is module number two, um, from an academic viewpoint, and I felt the need to share that with you before we get started. Um, and as a result of my experience, most of my perspective is going to come from a startup um, environment. Uh, Catherine, maybe you'd like to tell us a little bit more about yourself. Well, thanks very much, Diane. And uh, it's my pleasure to participate in today's seminar. Um, you know, as with any legal presentation, I'll just add my disclaimer prior to getting started that uh, the comments I'm presenting today are my own, and I'm not speaking on behalf of TELUS. But uh, Diane's right, we do come from a bit of different backgrounds. And prior to taking a position in-house, I was in private practice with a national firm and worked with smaller clients as well as larger institutional enterprise type clients. And then I went in-house with a large national company with $10.4 billion of annual revenue and approximately 28,000 employees. So our experience is a bit different. and. Uh, what we wanted to know prior to getting started was a little bit more about our participants. So to tailor our discussion and the examples that we may use during the presentation, um, we wanted to get to know you a little better. Prior to starting, we'd like you to answer the following participant questions. Starting with uh, question number one, how many people does your entity employ? Okay. Yeah, so it appears that a large number of the group um, has a, a large number of employees. Yeah, with the majority it looks like between 1,000 and 5,000. Okay, that's great. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And we can move to the next question. Participant question number two. How many lawyers are there in your legal department? Okay, interesting. Okay, so it looks as though the majority, oh, it's pretty close. So 3 to 10 and a close second of 11 to 49. Right, with a, about a quarter of the people in one or two person, two lawyer offices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. great. Thank and, you. Thanks. And moving to question number three. Where does your entity operate? Okay. Forty percent right. nationally, yeah, about a quarter internationally. Okay, great. Okay, great, thank you. And now the final question, in what industry does your entity operate? Hmm. Well, about a third in other, which gives us a lot. Yeah, I was thinking that, that, that doesn't really help us a lot, I suppose. <laughs> but uh, no, it's good to know. So a, a, a good portion in public sector as well. Okay. Right. Great. Well, Great. thanks very much. That information is really helpful, and we appreciate you taking uh, 
the opportunity to participate in the uh, questions. So moving along here, we can take a look at the agenda. Today's topics are broken down into three modules. Module one, the role of in-house counsel in risk management. Module two, ethical framework for in-house counsel. And module three, in-house counsel, business and risk management. So following this discussion of each of these modules, we will have a question and answer session. And as you can see on this slide, for each of these modules, we'll be discussing in detail the major subpoints listed below. The format for this presentation is going to be conversational, and both Diane and I will be speaking on each topic based on our practice experiences. However, having said that, and as noted earlier, I will be taking the lead on Module 1, the role of in-house counsel in risk management. Diane's going to take the lead on the discussion for Module 2, the ethical framework for in-house counsel. And we will both discuss Module 3, in-house counsel, business and risk management. So module one, in-house practice has evolved, I think, from being merely a legal advisor to include functions that not only involve the supply of legal services to the corporation, but also involve managing and reviewing legal services provided to corporate clients by outside counsel, providing advice on regulatory and legal requirements, and also creating procedures, policies, and compliance programs. One of the greatest benefits that I think in-house counsel bring is that because they know the business well, they can give practical advice, and they also have increased awareness of potential areas of risk, as well as a greater understanding of the company's risk tolerance. So in-house practice tends to incorporate ethical and reputational considerations along with legal advice steering clients, the organization, et cetera, towards decisions and processes that will help the company succeed. For example, just because something's legal doesn't always mean it should be done. There's a whole host of other considerations, including reputational considerations, how customers would see the actions, how shareholders would see the actions, and all of those are things that must be considered by the business as well as legal. Diane, did you have anything to add on this slide? No, thank you. So before we get further into this module, we have a polling question. And the polling question number one is, does a representative from your legal department have a seat at meetings where the entity's risks are assessed and addressed? It's very encouraging to see that the majority of people do at least sometimes have participation in these meetings. Yeah, this is actually really interesting and it's a great lead-in to our discussion of this module because, of course, we're going to be emphasizing the importance of legal being at the table and assessing risks, but also that managing those risks is really a joint responsibility of both the business and the legal teams, and not simply a legal exercise, but really needs to be done together to be effective. So risk and its management. You know, from my perspective, risk and risk management are almost overused terms, as they're used in a number of areas with somewhat different meanings. But for the purposes of our discussion today, when we're talking about risk, we're talking about uncertainty of actions and decisions. And when we're talking about risk management in this discussion, we're talking about identification, assessment, and prioritization of risks, followed by a coordinated application of resources to help minimize, 
monitor and control the probability and or impacts of negative events to potentially maximize benefits and opportunities for the organization. And I think that a lot of people forget the second part of the definition, that it can be used to maximize opportunities as well as to protect against dangers. So why is risk management important and who determines risk? Risk management is important because the risks and considerations can be very different depending on the organization, on what or industry it operates in and where it actually operates. To me, the objective of risk management involves striking that right balance between inherent risks of the business and its operations on the one side and business opportunities available to the organization on the other. The value, I think, of being in-house counsel is that you have a better understanding of the business and its operations. You understand where the risks lie and what the pressure points may be for the organization. And you also have a good understanding of the company's tolerance for risk, which of course, again, can also vary depending on a whole number of things and be a spectrum for each company where zero risk is likely for legally mandated requirements, but depending on the business itself, the organization could actually be quite risk tolerant in certain circumstances where risks may be significant if they would occur, but the likelihood of occurrence may be so low that risk may be tolerated in certain circumstances. The value as in-house counsel is that you can help to see possible problems before they happen so problems can be avoided or planned for and mitigated and provide added value to the organization at the same time. The entity's risk appetite, like Catherine was talking about, um, is something that cannot be determined at a particular point. It continually changes. And if you ask uh, an organization what is this risk appetite, they're not going to be able to tell you. I really think it's something that you're going to observe over a period of time. Um, they can say what they're willing to take in a particular instance, but when you try to get it across the spectrum, they're not going to be able to tell you. So you really need to participate and observe these things in order to kind of get a, a feel for what it is they're willing to take. Um, risk management, of course, is an immature activity in a lot of organizations, and so it may be appropriate for legal to really push this idea to executives if they really don't understand about the need to have a risk appetite and to what kind of boundaries they want to um, experience within that risk appetite. So legal risks and business risks. The risks facing any organization, of course, can be legal and business related. For example, there can be risks due to uncertainty in financial markets, project failures, legal liabilities, accidents, natural disasters, and of course, the, <laughs> the ever-present risks in unpredictable events. And I think that we've seen a lot of the unpredictable events part this, just this past week with the hurricane, of course, along the eastern seaboard. Um, lots of things that no one really expected and maybe weren't willing, ready to handle. Um, and just as an example, um, if any of you saw the footage of the evacuation of the hospital in New York City, um, where they clearly had a plan to take out those neonatal babies, um, and move them to a different place, and the, op the operations that they undertook in order to get that to happen, that was something that they had clearly planned for. So it was a risk that they had obviously considered and undertaken some policies and, uh, and procedures to address. Um, and other of these lists that's on the slide, um, there's stock price fluctuation, there's investment problems, product popularity, um, and project failures. I mean, some people are willing to take a big risk and some only a little one or not at all. And so in each of these circumstances, we need to figure out what it is that is within the risk appetite of the entity that we serve. Now, 
And just as there are a number of risks from both a legal and business standpoint, there are, of course, a number of methods and strategies that can be used to help mitigate or manage risk depending on the situation and it can include such strategies as you know, transferring the risk to another party, for example, through insurance or hedging or outsourcing, avoiding the risk by choosing not to undertake certain activities or only doing a modified version of the activity, reducing the negative effect or probability of individual risk and try to mitigate risk through preventative and proactive control measures and there's also just accepting some or all potential or actual consequences of a particular risk where the benefits of doing so may outweigh the costs of transfer or mitigation. Anything on that slide, Diane? Um, actually, I'm just thinking that there might be a last one which may or may not be included in the above, which is those people who just ignore it. Um, I'm not sure that they con consciously accept the risk, but they just think that they're flying under the radar and as a result don't need to even consider it. Oh, and we've never encountered that as an issue, have we? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we're the only ones on the call. I'm sure. <laughs> All right. So overcoming challenges, my approach has always been that assessing and addressing risks are always a joint responsibility between the legal team and the business team. As in-house counsel, we really help to identify the risks and also should be working with the business team in determining how the company can better manage risks. The more successful approach to a company's risk management is really joint development and responsibility for identifying those risks, overcoming those challenges or risks, and developing resources that are actually going to work. Without that interaction between business and legal, it is extremely difficult, not only to assess risk, but to be able to manage risk successfully. So one of the first steps, I think, should be identifying the risks facing the organization. And it's important to consider both internal risks, for example, business processes, products, service quality, business strategy, organization strength and ethics, but you can't lose sight of also the external risks, which of course can include the economy, the competitive landscape, perhaps regulatory requirements, technology developments, and market conditions. Legal cannot identify these alone, but requires the business team's input and also their buy-in to be successful and to put in the necessary programs, internal controls, and whatever else you're going to use to manage those risks. I believe that a key strategy to successfully manage risk is to have the business team actively engaged and for the legal department to have a good relationship with the business team. This allows you, as the in-house counsel, the ability to take a more proactive approach in helping to manage possible risks to the company rather than being reactive and after the fact involvement that can, of course, certainly help address issues once they happen, but which you would like to try and avoid altogether. From my experience, it is extremely helpful if you have a good relationship with the business team as you want them to come to see legal ideally as a strategic advisor and not simply a checkpoint or a hurdle that they have to get through. And I wish that you could see me shaking my head yes to everything that you've said. <laughs> <laughs> I do agree. I mean, basically they need to think that you are not the the department that halts everything, that they that you're actually a partner with them and that they come to you, like you say, so that you can interact with them proactively rather than just reactively. And this requires um, that everyone trusts you, and if you are in a startup like I have been, it's making friends with these people in a business sense such that they know they can trust you and come to you when they think that there might be a problem or where they're considering taking a step where they don't know where they're going. 
or even if they do know where they're going, and it tends not to be a good idea. No, great point, Diane. So I think hand in hand with having that good relationship with the business team is ensuring that once those risks are identified, there are internal and external resources that are developed, implemented, and most importantly, followed. I think it's imperative that as part of legal's role to ensure that there is good education of the business team. This is crucial as legal cannot be everywhere in all parts of the company, with all employees, at all times. But having said that, a well-educated business team that's aware of risks and their possible implications also serve as watchdogs, for lack of a better word, that are live to the risk issues and can help to identify them in advance of them becoming a significant problem for the company. It's also important that there is accountability at all levels in an organization so that there are appropriate policies and procedures that promote good practices, which at a minimum should comply with applicable laws, of course, and ideally promote trust and confidence in the company, which in turn enhances the organization's competitive and reputational advantages. From my experience, you can put into place a number of programs, policies, or whatever, but without a strong relationship with the business team, and certainly without buy-in from the top of the organization, people will often not take this seriously, and it will go to the bottom of the pile, and people will often take the attitude that they can think about it later. As with anything, people are often more receptive to ethics-based changes and programs being implemented when the leaders of the organization actually embody those values in practice and don't only talk about them. Leaders of the organization promoting programs, policies, etc., can help to increase you know, a number of things, including pride and enthusiasm for the employees, along with a desire by the employees to be better corporate citizens. You know, don't get me wrong, an ethical and accountable culture needs to permeate the entire organization, but a clear and convincing desire to foster such a culture should start from the top. For me, the key thing should be that everyone should be involved, and this should not simply be a legal exercise or undertaking, and that once programs and policies are implemented, there are regular updates to refresh, refresh sorry, the knowledge of the business team, and also for program improvements as well. I totally agree that buy-in from the top and leadership from that arena is most important because otherwise legal is crying by itself in the desert and people do then tend to push it aside and not engage with the whole idea of um, being a company of high integrity where the employees themselves are great participants in that organization's process. Um, and one of the things I found in a startup, of course, is teaching younger employees, especially younger executives, the ideas of risk management and the reason that integrity is so important. Um, as a result of my work with startups, I found that this is an extremely important and often difficult um, undertaking for counsel. And sometimes, of course, what the implementation of resources includes bringing in external counsel um, when there's a need to do so. Um, not to rely on them all the time, but actually if there's some certain expertise that you may lack, a really important idea to bring them in. Thanks, Diane. So that brings us to the end of Module 1. Sherry, are there any questions? Uh, yeah, we have time for a few questions. Um, the first one, uh, Diane, I guess I'll direct this one to you. Uh, my, okay. client, my client entity does not include legal in its important meetings, including those that address risk management. I believe that I have information that would be important to contribute to such discussions and that my advice would be beneficial for the client entity. What should I do? Uh, this can be a real problem. Um, first off, you probably don't have the universe of information that you need in order to give appropriate advice. Um, so what you may need to do is to, um, if you can't get yourself invited to the meeting, which would, of course, be the most important thing, but if for some reason you continue to be excluded from the meeting, 
Um, if you end up writing a memo with the advice, you probably need to indicate that these are the facts as you know them to be and then give the advice based on those facts and pass it to someone who's going to the meeting um, and let them take it in. Um, you, I think that the important part of the factual statement is to close what you understand to be the universe of facts at that point so that it's clear that that's what your advice is based on. Um, if you can get yourself invited to the meetings, like I said, that's optimum. If you can't, then I think that's probably the best you can do. Um, and the hope is, of course, that with the advice that you have given, that you'll be invited to the meeting next time or perhaps called in during the course of, which would be best. Catherine, do you have anything that you would like to add? Actually, I, I, <laughs> something did just come to mind. I was thinking, you know, of you, you just have to stress the importance of you being at the table. And I think that you can effectively do that by pointing to many of the very recent, very public examples of executives who have ignored legal issues and avoided or ignored legal advice, including asking them, you know, how would they look in prison orange uniforms? If you make it, <laughs> if you make it real, um, you very often get the business team's attention. Yes, except if, unless they're the people who ignore the risk. <laughs> well, there's not much you can do about that. <laughs> no. <laughs> but then you're on record of, have, of having advised them. True enough, true enough. All right, great. Thank you. Um, and Catherine, I, I'll pose the next one to you, and I, I think this is probably the um, only the last question we'll have for this module. Uh, what can you do to create a good relationship with the business team or repair a bad relationship? Well, you know, of course, as, as I've already mentioned, I think, you know, from my experience, your your job becomes a lot easier uh, if you have a good relationship with the business team because you want them to see legal as I've mentioned as a strategic advisor and not just a checkpoint or a hurdle that they have to you know tick the box to get through. But um, some of the things that I actually do is to get involved with the business team and. I attend weekly strategic planning and review meetings with the business team. Um, you know, I learn what they're doing, what their concerns are, and what their motivations and pressure points are. Um, and I share thoughts and concerns, you know, during those meetings up front. And I think that helps foster an understanding and appreciation of our respective roles and issues and actually helps to start building teamwork. Uh, they get to know me, of course. I get to know them outside of the pressures of uh, a deal situation. And understanding people on personal levels and, and seeing the importance you place on openness and integrity in a day-to-day -day setting, I think helps to really reinforce the importance of ethics in the company. And knowing you on a personal level, too, and knowing that you treat people fairly will also encourage that business team to come to you with problems they encounter instead of trying to hide or bury them. So that would be, those were my thoughts. Diane, I don't know if you have something else. Um, I agree with you, and I think it's really important to establish a more personal business relationship with them rather than one that only comes up at in times of crisis um, or in times when they need your advice to do a deal. Um, so I think that perhaps, you know, enjoying coffee with them sometimes or having a lunch with them um, is important to build that sort of rapport that you need in order to get them to cooperate with you um, and to include you in all those things that you need to know. And it just gives you a great opportunity to actually see what the business units are doing, too. And, you know, that... Yeah. Experience is, is second to none, and it really helps to build credibility because, of course, then you enhance your own understanding of the business. Absolutely. And I think that's all the time we have for questions on Module 1. Is that right, Terry? That's correct. Okay. So we'll move to Module 2, and Diane, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, great. And as I said before, this is an academic discussion, um, mostly because I'm not a member of any of the Canadian Law Societies. So the outline for our Module 2 is these three points, solicitor client privilege, confidentiality, and conflicts of interest. Um, so now um, we have one polling question for you right here. Who in your entity reviews non-disclosure agreements? 
uh, is that the executives, the executives and legal, the business team only that's concerned with this particular NDA, the business team and legal, legal only or no one, which is not a great answer, but uh, sometimes. And so, hi, I see that a different polling question yeah. has been uh, placed here. Uh, the polling question we were actually looking for is the one that's now appearing, who in your entity reviews nondisclosure agreements. If you could respond to that, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, well, it looks like the majority is business team and legal um, or executive and legal. And the great answer is that someone is always reviewing NDAs. Good, good. And I think, you know, from my perspective, um, you know, these agreements are important. And I often think that they're overlooked, but they can be really significant from a legal standpoint. You know, often companies try to bury non-competes, exclusivity, and non-solicitation clauses in NDAs, which can have significant ramifications for your company. And in my experience, there is rarely such a thing as a simple or standard NDA, yet they are way too often treated that way. So these are great results. Yes, absolutely, I agree. And yes, there are a lot of people who are trying to be clever and, and to bury these other issues within an NDA. And it's something that people who are business only, not legal, may not understand. So as a result, a legal's participation in the review of NDAs and drafting thereof is really important. Okay, so we will go on now to the next slide. And it appears to me from my academic review of this topic um, is that the Canadian solicitor client privilege is split into two pieces. Um, The first part being the legal advice privilege. And legal advice, of course, is driven by the person who seeks the advice. Does that person expect that his or her decision or course of action is going to have legal implications? And if that is true, then the communications, verbal or written, of a confidential character between a client and a legal advisor directly related to the seeking, formulated, formulating, or giving of legal advice or legal assistance is what's covered here in this part of the privilege. Um, So as a result, um, one of the things that you should know is that this privilege survives forever uh, unless it's been undermined by some sort of waiver, which we're going to discuss in a second. So this is a privilege that doesn't end. Now, the biggest, um, well, I'm going to talk about that in a second, but the second split on solicitor-client privilege um, appears to be the litigation privilege, which has to do with papers and materials created or obtained specifically for the lawyer's brief for litigation, whether existing or contemplated. Um, This applies only where the dominant purpose for which the record was obtained or created is the litigation. Um, If you work in the U.S., um, this part of the privilege would probably have a different name called work product. Um, And realize that the um, items obtained or created here can come from third person so long as the purpose is met. And this part of the privilege ends at the termination of litigation, unlike the advice portion of the privilege, which lasts forever. And and just to add to what Diane has mentioned, you know, so for solicitor client privilege, as you know, I'm sure we all know, the requirements really are communication must be confidential, it must be between the client and the legal advisor, and it must be directly related to legal advice. You know, and it's it's crucial that the business team understands this concept because I'm certain that I'm probably not alone, but too often I've seen, and I'm sure many of you have had the same experience, is that business people will throw privilege on all sorts of documents and think that that buys them something. And, you know, I've needed to explain to them that not only is that useless, but it makes them look foolish. So, you know, it, we can't even underscore enough the how imperative it is that the business team really gets these concepts as well. I totally agree with um, Catherine's comment. 
And yes, um, on the next slide, it talks about the privilege only applies when the advice is given by a lawyer acting at the time in the role of a legal advisor. The privilege does not apply when the ad when the advice is non-legal. Um, so again, just like Catherine was saying, putting the term privileged on something does not make it so. And the fact that they come to you and ask for advice on business does not make it a privileged conversation. And this is something that everyone needs to understand. And it's my experience that a lot of business people don't. And so educating them is a really important part of in-house counsel's job. And, and solicitor-client privilege, as we all know, is based on the need for the lawyer to know everything, right, that relates to the client's reasons for seeking representation to ensure that the lawyer will be able to carry out the representation effectively. So the purpose of this privilege is to encourage and ensure that there's the full communication between lawyers and their clients. And, you know, it's really essential to operation of our legal system. But as well, only when, you know, as Diane has mentioned, the advice or communications are provided by in-house counsel in his or her capacity as a lawyer will it be privileged. And, you know, this creates an interesting tension because on the one hand, you would like and, and you want to be part of the business team because of your knowledge and understanding of the business and its operations. But this requires real awareness and a process to ensure that privilege is maintained as necessary because business advice will not typically be viewed as being protected by privilege. Great. Thank you, Catherine. And so now the next slide talks about who's my client. Um, when you're in a private practice and you have individual clients, like you start to be a criminal lawyer, for example, it's really easy to identify who my client was. But when you go in-house, of course, it's a little more difficult. Um, we know it's the entity, but do the people that you work with understand that? That becomes the big question. Um, the, the identity of the client may be shaded by provincial laws um, applicable in this circumstance and the way that those laws are interpreted, and realize that the Canadian Bar Association and American Bar Association rules regarding corporate clients are slightly different with the American Bar Association rules a little bit broader. Um, but the client really, as if you're in-house counsel, is the corporation who has an opportunity to speak on its own and as a result requires you to give it its voice. And the people with whom you work really need to understand that. Um, they, if they're young and startup, like my clients often are or my business often is, um, I really need to make them understand that I voice the, that I am the voice of the entity itself, and that's my job is to give it that voice, not to represent those individuals who make up the executive team or the employee team. Now, do management and staff understand this concept? How sophisticated are they? Like I said, I'm used to working in startups recently. They're not very sophisticated, and I really have to make this clear to them who it is I speak for and what perspective I take. And then also the employees need to understand that you are not their personal lawyer. Some of them think that that's the case. And sometimes they will come, at least to me, with things that, are in conflict with the overall corporate entity, at which point I have to tell them that I can't speak to them about this and they need to find another lawyer to address this. Um, but sometimes this can be an issue for people who are unsophisticated legally. Catherine? Um, I was just going to comment, of course, you know, for every jurisdiction you should check your own professional code of conduct, but I'm based in Alberta and uh, you know, certainly the Alberta Code of Professional Conduct provides that Although a lawyer may receive the instructions from an officer or an employee or an agent or representative, when a lawyer is employed or retained by a, corp a corporation or an organization, the lawyer actually, though, only acts for the organization in exercising his or her duties in providing professional services. So while the in-house counsel may receive instructions from a variety of representatives within the organization, the lawyer still only acts for the organization when providing legal services. And as Diane's mentioned, that's really key. There's a, there's a big distinction, and I don't know that a lot of business people really uh, understand that. So it's, it's always also important to remember that as in-house counsel, of course, you have a duty to the organization you work for, but that duty is, of course, overridden by the obligation from being part of the legal profession with the responsibility to act ethically and morally 
And it's also very important for the business team to understand that concept as well. And, you know, to Diane's point, um, the in, -house, in the in-house context, an important consideration often is who actually qualifies as a client that may invoke privilege. And typically the client, of course, is a corporation, but individual directors, employees, officers, all too often believe that they are also clients. And this concept is really important for those individual directors, employees, and officers to understand. And it's important for in-house counsel to make sure that you take steps to clarify that with them. Education is really the key. I just can't stress that enough. And if you haven't had seminars with your people, you probably need to do that. Okay, we'll move on now to the next slide. And thank you, Catherine, for your comment. I appreciate that. Um, international applications. As some of you are probably aware, um, in the countries in the uh, European Union, in-house counsel does not seem to have access to the solicitor client privilege. So you might want to be aware of that. Um, I myself am not certain um, how the law is determined if it's, for example, if it's a contractual situation, if it's the governing law that um, sets this policy or if it's your practice location, but do be aware that in certain situations when you assume solicitor client privilege may be available to you, it may not be. So you probably want to explore all of that before you um, assume certain things that may not be true. Um, there are also limitations on these protections. Um, we're going to talk about um, waivers and the crime fraud exception in just a moment. Catherine, do you have anything to add here? No, thanks, Diane. Okay. So now we're going to talk about privilege will be undermined by an informed waiver of the privilege by the client or its agent. And an agent is anyone who acts on behalf of the corporation, and that includes you as corporate counsel. So we need to really be careful that we, as the agent for our entity client, do not in any way waive any privileges, and we need to teach our employees and staff that they can waive the privilege and how that they can preclude that, that possibility because we really don't want that to happen. Um, we also know that when the client attempts to obtain legal advice that would facilitate or a crime or a fraud, that that pro that particular communication or those range of communications also are not privileged for a very obvious reason. So you need to put into place a good management of privileged documents, both hard copy and soft copy, in order to avoid any implied waivers. And people need to know how to address oral information as well. Um, so it's very important to teach them, again, I, as a teacher, I just can't express clearly enough how important it is to teach them. Catherine? I think too that of course, you know, you just you just can't uh you can't really sort of underestimate the importance of education in this particular area. And privileged communications, of course, should be treated as confidential information and how they're sent and generally dealt with throughout the organization needs to be controlled. So here's a good example of why you know corporate email policies are critical, um, but so too is the understanding by everyone about why such policies are needed and why they're important, and you know that just can't be emphasized enough. I absolutely agree. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so let's go on to the next one. Um, it, does everybody in the entity know the rules? Um, one of the things that you might like to think about if you haven't done this already is to hold a seminar, of course, that it, everyone in the corporation uh, comes to where you teach them about these concepts. Um, you probably want to have this video recorded and then make viewing of this video recording a part of the onboarding process for new employees um, because there's always going to be some turnover or some change in employee composition. And as a result, um, you will have people who maybe don't know the rules and they just come on, you know, one month after you've given it and you give it annually. And so there's an 11-month period where they don't have the information. 
so probably a good idea to make viewing of this particular recording part of the onboarding requirements when someone um, comes to the organization as a new employee. Um, and of course, this should be updated regularly, so you may want to re-record the video recording every year or so just to make sure that it's up to date. Um, and again, uh, as a person who works in startups recently, the protections required for legal in an informal office. Um, some of the places where I've worked are open space, which creates some huge problems for legal, especially when it comes to protecting privilege. And of course, we talk about expectations of privacy, so any meetings should be held in a conference room rather than in the open space area where you can be easily overheard. All of course, your um, screens need to be turned away where, from a place where anyone else can see them, so you need to sit with your back to the wall. Um, and then there are some other things, too, to make sure that you can separate legal from business roles um, and making sure that um, that people understand what's business and what's legal, and if not, maybe all conversations need to take place in a private room, and then you everything is everything is confidential, and then the things that need to be privileged are kept privileged. Um, be careful of a couple of things. Um, a counsel who has additional roles, for example, acting both as corporate counsel and as a corporate secretary. Corporate secretary, probably not privileged communications. Corporate counsel, probably privileged when you're talking about legal advice. Be careful also of employees that wear two hats, where someone has a law degree but is there working as an engineer or some other capacity and then is asked to give legal advice. Um, as a one-off here or there to take a look at this lease or take a look at this contract. When is he or she practicing law versus when they're acting as an employee or engineer? Um, and are they taking the precautions that they should when they're acting as counsel? And what protections does the company have when they're giving this particular advice? Um, also, if you're in an open space, um, it, it means you don't have an office. Um, have you locked up your documents? Do you do it every day? Um, who has keys? You know, the, the people who have access to this information should be really limited, and the people who have keys should be listed and not give them off to somebody else. As a result, you, know, you need to be really careful about all these things because in my experience in an informal open space office, it's pretty much, you know, everybody takes what they want. You have to make people understand that legal is a little different and as a result needs to be treated differently. Catherine? Yeah, I was just going to mention that, of course, too, uh, a critical consideration in determining whether privilege is waived is looking at how scrupulous the parties have been in limiting access to the privilege communications. So this is where careful documentation with the intention to maintain confidentiality helps to preserve privilege. For example, uh, privilege issues are often complicated very, uh, very often by the practical necessity of sharing that information or a portion of that information with individuals who may not clearly fall within the zone of privilege. For example, you know, financial advisors or auditors. Um, you know, and it's always very important for parties to seriously consider whether or not sharing privileged information is required. And if it must be shared, the parties may minimize the risk of waiver by sharing, of course, only the confidential information. But if privileged information must also be shared, it's very important to have a very clear privileged strategy. The risk of waiver can diminish to the extent that the organization limits that disclosure to as few documents as possible, to as few people as possible, and to also specifically document what documents are actually seen or exchanged. Absolutely. I mean, the need to know, I think, a uh, rule may be applied here. Who is it that really needs to know this information? And as Catherine said, documenting who's seen what when. Anything additional, Catherine? Oh, well, thanks, Diane. Okay, great. So we'll move on now to the idea of confidentiality, which is different than privilege, and it's actually quite a lot broader. And as you can see, the duty of confidentiality extends to all information learned 
during the course of interactions with a client whether or not the information is confidential. The duty is governed by your law society's code of conduct and by the common law of fiduciary duty. Um, realize that this information can be protected through express statements, for example, an NDA, or by implication. And although it would be preferable to have everything in writing, of course, that's not going to happen. So really need to make people understand that um, confidentiality is broader and that some circumstances of confidentiality can arise by implication. And, you know, I would just add, I would just add, Diane, that, you know, to me the difference between the two is that, you know, for example, solicitor-client privilege applies only to private client communications where the duty of confidentiality applies to all information gained from the representation. And confidentiality is, of course, a requirement for privilege. Um, and if a con communication is not made in circumstances of confidence, then, of course, it cannot be privileged. That's right. That's right. And again, another reason that everybody should understand these concepts so that they don't approach you with these particular questions in the elevator, for example. Okay, so we see by the next slide that the solicitor-client privilege applies only to communications between lawyer and client and is governed by the common law. And so compare that with the earlier slide that talks about the definition of confidentiality. Okay, so preserving confidentiality. Um, documents, making sure that they're controlled both hard copy documents and soft copy documents. Just because it's an email doesn't mean that it needs to go everywhere. Um, people need to know about waiver. You need to train them about it. And they need to understand the need to know policy. Not everybody needs to know everything. And the widespread dissemination of information is a very bad idea, unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, unwritten information, again, oral information is as confidential as written, but it's harder to pin down because there's nothing in writing. Another reason that people, again, need to understand the concept. And does everyone in the entity know the rules? You know, and there was a story in the New York Times last week that I want to bring to your attention. Um, you may have seen it. If you didn't and you'd like to see more about it, you can write me and I'll send you the link. It was at Citigroup. Um, a junior analyst disclosed confidential information about the Facebook IPO to a tech blog and lost his job. And then his supervisor, in a separate incident, disclosed information about YouTube's financials to a foreign journalist without Citigroup's prior approval, which was required as part of Citigroup's policy. Um, this supervisor had been named the number one Internet analyst for five consecutive years, yet he failed to follow the rules. Um, he sent the information to the foreign journalist by email, and when he was confronted about this, he first denied sending the email and then um, tried to get Citigroup's IT group to redate his email to show that it had come after approval had been gained to discuss this, even though, of course, that was untrue. When this circumstance came to light, this particular analyst was also fired by Citigroup. Um, the person's name was in the New York Times. I know that he'll probably get another job because of his skill at being a number one analyst, but do you really trust somebody like this? So just because someone's been with the organization for a long time or has really important information, you can't expect that everybody knows the rules or is going to play by them. It's really important that everybody understands and everybody performs according to the policies. Catherine? Oh, nothing to add, Diane. Thanks. Okay. So we'll go on to the next bit, which is about conflict of interest. 
And a conflict of interest um, here we're going to define as a situation in which a person has a duty to more than one person or organization but cannot do justice to the actual or potentially adverse interests of both or all parties. And how can these conflicts arise? They can arise internally. So, for example, you can have an employee with some conflicts that arise because of his or her personal uh, business or former employee employers or something like that. Um, you can have a department versus department warfare or an intra-department warfare between two people who are competing for superiority, for example, or dominance within that team. So that can be a conflict that you would have to be aware of and somehow address. And then inter-entity conflicts, for example, divergent interests between a parent and a subsidiary where you're counsel for both. I've seen that happen, and that can be a huge uh, dilemma for you. Um, and it might be best in circumstances like that to remove yourself from one of the entities and appoint external counsel to represent the other. And then, of course, external, a business versus another business and their conflicts as they arise, perhaps as a result of a contract that requires conflicting obligations. Catherine? No, nothing to add. Okay. So, and conflict of interest rules are applicable to entities, uh, the entity itself, to the executives, to the non-executives, and, of course, to counsel. Um, so this can be an issue all the way around, and everyone needs to understand conflicts of interest and how to address them. And how to address them is on the next slide. And before we move along, Catherine, do you have anything to add? You know, I was just going to add, and, and perhaps it, it's just as well that we, uh, we're here. But I, again, to me, this is a, a really good example of an important concept for the business team to understand and for there to be some education of the business team on. For in-house counsel, where these conflicts of interest can arise in a number of scenarios with a number of people, as has just been shown on uh, other slides, um, and where the client is considered to be the corporation and not the individual directors, officers, employees, this can cause ethical problems, of course, when the director, officer, or employee's interests appear to be in conflict with the corporation. And that's why it's, it's so important for the business team to recognize and understand who your client actually is. It's helpful to explain this to the business team and, of course, needs to be explained when the in-house counsel knows or reasonably should know that the organization's interests are adverse to those with whom the lawyer is dealing with. In such circumstances, you know, of course, the in-house counsel should advise those directors or officers or employees that any discussion they have with the in-house counsel may not be privileged and that the individual may wish instead to obtain individual counsel for representation. Great. Thanks. Okay, so we'll move on to the next slide. And how are we going to address the conflict of interest? Um, it's important to get all the facts before you advise. And you need to encourage everyone to be candid and open with you. It's hope, I'm hopeful that you have been able to create that atmosphere before, and this is not the first time that you will encounter this with them because they're used to coming to talk to you because they value your advice and consider you a confidant. Um, but if not, you do need to get as much information as you can, document that information, and then give the advice based thereon. And it's important to, under, to remember to be hard on the problem but not on the people who bring it to you because you want them to feel comfortable to bring you problems in the future. Um, and who needs to know? All the executives, some of them, who has a need to know about this? And so there's no hard and fast rule here. Of course, it's going to depend on the individual situation. wish I could give you better advice. But it's really important for you to think about the universe of this issue and who needs to know about this and who can bring something to the table that will help you resolve. Catherine? Nothing else. Thanks. Okay. So I think then we'll move on to some questions that we have from our audience. Sherry? Sure. 
Yes, um, Diana, I'll pose the first one to you. What should okay. I advise? Sorry, what should I advise my client to do when it is discovered that an employee has brought into our office tangible confidential information from that employee's earlier position with a competitor? Oh, wow. Um, this is something that we see sometimes, not something we like, but um, we first off need to deal with the conflict, I think, figure out what it is that has happened, how the information has been brought in. Um, how it frames with what it is that we do and how to resolve that issue. And then we're also going to need to talk with the employee. I mean, is the employee still on probation? Is it someone that's very important to the organization? Does the person need to be disciplined? Do we need to break ties with this person? What's the company integrity that's at issue? There's a lot of questions here, so I think that a lot of these need to be answered before I can give you an answer to this particular question, but it's certainly a problem that raises an issue. Catherine, do you have any thoughts on this? No, I think you covered it well, Diane. Okay. Okay, then, Catherine, I have a, a question I'll pose to you. Can you provide tips or best practices for maintaining privilege? Wow, how much time do we have, Sherry? Because I, I could probably, this could be another module. Well, I this think. is probably our last question for this module. So, you know, okay. take your time. But. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, certainly there's a number of things to do or, or keep in mind. I think, you know, first and foremost, and this is something that's come through probably the entire presentation uh, today, is educate the business people on what privilege is and how to maintain it. So privilege only applies to lawyers. And it doesn't apply to people acting, you know, in a quasi-legal capacity. Well, for example, such as accountants, although if the communications, uh, the communications can be, of course, if they're retained by a lawyer for the purposes of performing services that will assist the lawyer in giving legal advice. But also educating the business people that privilege does not apply to business people, so you can tell them to stop putting it on all their materials. Um, communicating to recipients of advice that the advice is legal and not business related and to the extent possible do so at the top or very close to the beginning of a document. Um, consider using outside counsel if possible for internal investigations because of course they are more likely viewed as objective to third parties. Um, only provide information to those people that actually have a need for that information so it's not widely disseminated and you've got uh, a clear record of who saw what and when, um, keeping all documents confidential and marked privilege. And, you know, I always think that you should be preparing documents to show that the communication was made in confidence for the purpose of giving legal advice and with the expectation that it would be privileged. Um, you know, of course, you can also use technology to avoid inadvertent disclosure. And, you know, I have a tip because this is something that, uh, you know, I can remember years ago meeting a business person at a social function, like completely unrelated, not a client of mine, no one I had ever met before the social <laughs> gathering, but of course, you know, you ask, what do you do? And this person told me that, oh yeah, well, you know, he, he works on agreements, he's with such and such business, and he told me that, um, <laughs> that uh, what, the first thing he does when he gets a document is he actually looks at the metadata, and he thought it was a real strategic and competitive sort of business strategy, and of course I told him, you know, as a lawyer we can't do that, but just a careful tip to everybody about track changes and revision marks and when you use them. Um, I also think that it's important, like with really sensitive information, if you use technical restrictions on forwarding email, like that's something that's very easily done. And uh, just getting back to the preparing documents with the view that they might ultimately be disclosed. Like to the greatest extent possible, I think that means, you know, labeling documents privileged and confidential at the beginning of the document or as close as possible to the beginning of the document. And that just helps because of course then it minimizes perhaps the amount of information that uh, that people may read before they get to the explanation of why this document was created. Um, also, a really key one is separating out business and legal advice because, of course, that will further support a claim of privilege. Um, what else? Advising the business team to, to not always just copy in-house counsel is that's not an automatic guarantee of privilege, and I know a lot of people will do that. Uh, 
And I also know that as in-house counsel, of course, you have a number of roles, some of which have you on different business committees and teams. And I think it's important to clarify the role of the in-house counsel on those committees and teams, whether they're business or legal. Um, you know, don't, an obvious one is don't minute legal advice. Use sec separate uh, reports to do that. So, for example, minutes of board meetings are, are often producible in litigation. So the substance of the legal advice, of course, should not be included, but reference could be made that legal advice was discussed during the meeting only. And, uh, you know, you should consider adopting a corporate policy regarding circulation of confidential and privileged documents if you don't already have one, um, just so that you don't distribute documents containing legal advice to people who aren't directly involved with an issue uh, covered by the advice, as that, of course, will affect you know, the document being viewed as confidential and also affect privilege. And uh, also, you can limit the attendance of third parties. I know that very often a number of people will, will join meetings, but if they don't have a uh, reason to be there when the legal advice is, is being communicated, uh, I, I would tend to sort of keep it to the need to know people on a need to know basis. And I just think too, one thing that I always uh, warn people about is to be careful about the overuse of privileged on materials as I think that can damage counsel's credibility in a contested proceeding and may in fact actually result in a loss of privilege. So that's a really important consideration to, to remember as well. And, and I've probably gone on enough. I could keep going, but in interest of time, I'll stop. <laughs> Diane, do you have anything else? No, I just want to confirm with that I agree totally with everything that you've said, and particularly the overuse of the term privilege. Um, again, I think it can damage your credibility because if you make it believe that make believe that everything is privileged, then probably nothing will be. And also that if you're creating a document when you send it to outside or to another party, you want to save it. Um, as a final document and create a new document with a new name and that way there's no metadata for anyone to look at. Great. Thank you. Yeah, oh, and sorry. just by the way, I, if, I apologize for any um, noise that people are hearing. There's a remodeling in a suite near me that's going on. I asked them to wait until 1030 this morning, but clearly I don't have enough clout to make that stop. So anyway, I apologize for any background noise that I'm unable to control. Okay, Catherine? All right, so now we'll turn to Module 3 and the discussion of in-house counsel, business, and risk management. And so we're going to be looking at and discussing serving your client and your profession, building a culture of integrity, and advising in the corporate culture. And this brings us, I think, to our last polling question. Has your entity implemented formal risk management policies and procedures? All right, so. Oh, good. Everybody's making our job very easy, Diane. <laughs> yes, really, I love the, and regularly follows the procedures. That's a great answer. <laughs> okay, so it looks like the vast majority are yes and regularly follows those policies and procedures and you know, that's fantastic and of course sort of leads into our discussion of this module. Um, you know, probably worse than having no policies and procedures is having ones that no one follows and, and I guess probably to the worst of all scenarios may be having the policies that people follow inconsistently or sporadically so you're left to guess did they follow the policy that time or not so <laughs> interesting. Yeah, for so so for those 20% of people who have yes but doesn't always follow policies and procedures, mm, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So thank you very much for the answers. So of course for the purposes of this discussion, we'll be discussing the importance of having policies and procedures, ensuring that they're going to work for your organization. And so that, from my standpoint, means putting them in a format and implementing them for success and successful adoption and having senior business buy-in on the importance. So serving your client and your profession. 
As mentioned previously, it's always really important to remember that as in-house counsel, of course, you have a duty to the organization you work for, but that duty is overridden by the obligation from being part of the legal profession and the responsibility to act ethically and morally. And it is also very important for the business team to understand that concept as well, and they don't always do. So it's important to have that conversation. Diane? I beg your pardon. Um, I have nothing to add. Okay. So as discussed already, one of the biggest values we bring as in-house counsel is the good understanding of the business. So we understand the business, we understand the operations, the potential risks, and also the risk appetite of the organization. And you also have a good understanding of the processes, procedures, and policies that are necessary and how you can implement them. And, and as a result of that knowledge, most effectively, because not all organizations will adopt things the same way or in the same way meaningfully. Diane? Yes, and um, actually I think it's really important here that we talk about a couple of things. Um, legal and business roles, you know, in progressing toward building a culture of integrity. Um, everybody needs to be on board, everybody, and need to think about a couple of things. Um, first off, uh, just as an example, if there's an internal email that's possibly offensive, um, you probably need to bring it up to the people who've created it. Um, for example, I'm aware of an email recently that um, had was signed by Robert Mugabe and had a picture of uh, Muammar Gaddafi, of course, two of the bigger human rights abusers in the past couple of decades. And the person thought that it was funny to create this email and you know send it out to everyone. And this became um, her business profile. Now, what is anybody going to think who sees this outside the organization? You know, external counsel, uh, opposing party, business partner? What if this goes to litigation? Opposing counsel, jury? Oh my goodness. You know, so lots of people think that we as lawyers are a little too tight about these kinds of things, but really we see things in a long view and we probably need to see if we can make people understand that this can be an issue. And, of course, any problems like this will follow you both entity-wise and personally throughout your career if you are involved in it. So it's something you really want to try to avoid. Um, having done business one time with a group that um, during oral negotiations would make concessions and we would make concessions, and then when the red lines came, only our concessions were showed and not theirs, and it turned out that this continued to happen even though we had a discussion with them and subsequently we didn't do the deal with them. And even after that, the woman who had been counsel for this organization tried to use me as a reference for a job that she was applying to. You know, so all in all, this was very bad news for everyone. I told her, of course, that I could not be a reference with for her considering what she had done. And so I followed her personally, and of course the organization doesn't have a very good reputation either um, when it gets out that this is what they're doing. So, you know, everyone needs to participate in creating a culture of high integrity within the organization. Thanks, Diane. I think as well to be effective, and I think we've already mentioned this a number of times, you really need to develop an internal governance structure to be successful. And this really means buy-in from the top. So senior management needs to actively champion you know, programs and policies. Uh, we need to have ongoing training and regularly have employees sign off on whatever sort of programs and policies you have, making sure that it's mandatory, but also that it's tailored to the specific needs of the organization and also tailored to the particular culture because not, you know, it's important to ensure that uh, whatever is required from a legal or regulatory or a compliance standpoint is dealt with, but how actually a program is implemented or a policy is implemented will, will often, you know, you want to lead to the, the best chance of successful adoption, and that's really by taking into account what's going to work 
in your particular organization. Yeah, and it is very unique from organization to organization. Um, it's it's unique, like having a child. Each of them are different. And so you have to figure out what's going to work with this group of people in this situation. Now, this is an interesting, uh, interesting couple of questions here. What if the entity does not accept your advice or accepts but does not implement. And to take, you know, from my perspective, to take the typical lawyer response, I think the answer to this question is going to depend, or at least be somewhat dependent on the circumstances. So, for example, if, you know, this failure to accept advice or implement has something to do with a suspected crime or fraud, you know, the steps that you take may differ on the circumstances. Uh, if it is illegal or criminal, the answer is clear, and I'll talk about it, that in a second. But whether something is unethical or maybe unethical on a smaller scale, or where it involves reputation instead of legality or involves gray areas, um, I really don't think it's any different than any legal advice you give. You know, some of it's accepted, some of it isn't, and you move on. But, you know, if the organization has acted or is acting or is intending to act fraudulently or criminally or illegally, um, you know, and I'll comment on Alberta because I'm located in Alberta, but in Alberta, the lawyer would have to advise the person to whom the lawyer is taking instructions and, you know, the chief legal officer or both the CLO and the CEO that the conduct is or would be fraudulent, criminal, or illegal, and should be stopped. And then two, if necessary, because the person from whom the lawyer takes the instructions, or the CLO or the CEO refuses to stop the conduct, you would uh, advise progressively to the next higher persons or groups, including ultimately you know, the board of directors or trustees, or ultimately whatever the appropriate committee would be, that the conduct is or would be fraudulent, criminal, or illegal and should be stopped. And then again, if the organization, despite the lawyer's advice, continues with or intends to pursue the unlawful conduct, uh, I think it's pretty clear then that you must withdraw from acting in the matter. And then from a reputational standpoint yourself, you're going to want to have that as a consideration as well, because there are the obligations, of course, um, as a result of the professional code, but you know, you also have to think about yourself reputationally and where do you want to go? Diane? It, this is really, I agree, a two-pronged problem because you have to you have to protect the entity, but you also have to protect yourself. And you're not going to sacrifice the entity for your own purposes, but you really need to make sure that both are very well protected because even after you leave the organization, if you've left in a circumstance like this, um, you have your own reputation to protect, and you need to make sure that that's a good one. And how you can do that, of course, varies in the situations. Um, so again, no, unfortunately, no blanket advice, but you have to make sure that you, A, didn't do anything that's going to follow you, and B, you also have to worry about being the scapegoat if you leave. So again, a, an issue that's not easily addressed. Thanks, Diane. And that brings us to the end of the presentation. Thank you, Diane and Catherine. Um, you certainly provide us with some essential and practical information on risk management and related ethical aspects for corporate counsel. And to all participants, you know, thank you for attending today's online webinar. If you're interested in receiving more guidance from Diane and Catherine, please find their contact details on your screen. Also, in addition to the link to today's presentation slide provided on the left-hand side of your screen, you will be emailed a copy of the presentation slides along with Diane and Catherine's responses to some of the unanswered questions that were submitted today. We now invite you to take a couple of minutes to complete a brief survey to be entered into a draw to win $100. To access the survey, please keep your browser window open and click on the link provided. Your input is especially valuable to us as we will use your feedback to craft the next online webinar in this series. So thank you again and good luck with the survey prize draw.